<laughs> but we thank God for being here on this morning. Amen. We thank God for each and every one of you. Every time I get a chance to speak to this congregation, you know, I don't take it, I don't take it lightly. Anytime you get to bring the word of God, that's, that's a, a, a serious business. And I told God a long time ago, Lord, whenever you give me a chance to speak, that I will bring it in every uh, bit of authority and power that you grant me to bring it in. And I will never, ever take down on that promise that I made to God. Uh, you know, sometimes I don't take myself very seriously, but I take the Word of God and the work of God extremely seriously. So, this morning, before we begin, shall we pray? Lord God, we thank you right now, God. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to share your word among your people, among this body, Lord God. And as we prepare on this morning, God, we ask that you would come right now, Lord God. Come into this room, Lord. Let your spirit rest and rule and abide in this place, God. Let it pour down, God, and let it hit the hearer. Anoint the ears to hear right now, Lord God. Break up the hearts, Lord that the word may soak in and find root on this morning. God, we know that we can do nothing without you, God, but with you we can do everything. Our words mean nothing, Lord, but your anointing means everything. Your spirit means everything, Lord God. I'll speak, Lord, but you do the work on this morning. 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 God, and I thank you for that right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we give you the glory and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God is good, isn't he? Amen, 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 amen. I hope you're glad to be here this morning. I hope you're happy to be here this morning. Amen. When we consider what could have been on this morning, amen. As bad as the situation was, it could have been worse. Amen. And we, can, we can't thank anybody for that but God. Because it's a wonder. I watched the news, and they were saying that this thing's a Category 5. It's a Category 5. It's going to be, there's nothing that can slow it down. The water is warm. It's just going to suck up that water, and it's going to hit the shores, and it's going to be a Category 5. There's nothing in its way but God. Amen. 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 So we thank God for all that he's done. Amen. And we pray for those people in North Carolina and South Carolina because the, the rain and the waves were devastating to them. And I can't imagine leaving home and coming back and everything that you have is gone. So they're going to need support, but they're going to need our prayers also. Amen? Amen. Amen. That being said, my scripture that I'm going to read to you this morning and we're going to come from Two places in the New Testament, the book of John and the book of Romans. And these scriptures should be so familiar to everyone, especially John 3.16. This is probably the first scripture that everybody learned when they were a kid. And we all should be able to recite it verbatim. And it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then we're going to go to Romans, the fifth chapter, verses five, uh, the fifth chapter, verses six, seven, and eight. And it says, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadvent for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. My, my, my topic for today is responding to God's love. Hmm. You know that God loves you? Do y'all know that? Well, I want you to know today that 
God loves you. If you didn't know that, I want you to know that God loves you. Amen. And he cares about you. And it's not because of who you are. And it's not because we deserve it. It's not because we earned it. And it's not because God is obligated to give us to us. God's not obligated to give us anything. He doesn't owe us anything. But yet he gives us everything. He freely gives us everything. Scripture tells us in Isaiah, the 55th chapter, it says that everyone that thirsts, come ye to the water. And he that has no money, come and buy and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money or without price. He gives us everything we need for life, for health. And he doesn't charge us anything. It's free. He said, come and buy it. Come and get it without money and without price. If he charged us for it, we wouldn't be able to afford it anyway. We wouldn't have enough money. So he doesn't even put a price on it. He just says it's free. And you know what? He only does this for one reason. Because he loves us. That's it. He does it because he loves us. The scripture says we love him because he first loved us. Regardless of our imperfections, God loves us. He loves us past our hard hearts. He loves us past our stubbornness. He loves us past our willful disobedience. He still loves us. You know, sometimes we can be hard to love. But God loves us anyway. Sometimes people want to take away their love when folk don't do exactly what they want them to do. When I can't control you and have you exercise my will the way I want it to be exercised, sometimes folks have a way of withdrawing their love. But God isn't like that. He loves us through all of those things. But sometimes we can be hard to love. But that's how love works. If you love someone, you look beyond their shortcomings. You look past their bad habits. You look past their ugliness at times. And you love them right on through those things. That's how love works. See, most of us don't really have a, a true idea of what love really is. But this is what God, this is, this is how love works with God. Now I'm going to tell you something here. Now, some of you may not realize this. You know, by me standing here and you all just looking at me and, you know, I come to church and, and greet you all every Sunday. Some of you all may not realize that I'm not the easiest person in the world to live with. You may find it hard to believe that I have some annoying habits. Sometimes I can be stubborn. Sometimes I say the wrong thing. Sometimes I'm sure your veteran would just as soon kick me as kiss me. Sometimes. <laughs> but then, you know what? I got an epiphany. I did. I had one of those moments of clarity a long time ago, and I realized something. 
I realize that she only puts up with me and all of my idiosyncrasies and all of the things that I do that she really can't tolerate. All of my quirks, she only puts up with those things because she loves me. And I'll tell you this thing for two reasons. One, I hope it's going to score me some points. <laughs> And number two, to illustrate my point. <laughs> my response to her loving me through all of my stuff is for me to try to love her more. I try to express it in ways that she can understand in ways that she can see and understand to let her know that I appreciate what she does for me and that she's important to me and that she matters to me and that she's a priority in my life. Whether it's for me to get up and cook her breakfast one morning or whether or not it's for me to get up one Saturday or morning and say, honey, what do you want to do today? Let's, I'm going to go and do whatever you want to do all day. She drags me to some places I might not want to go. <laughs> but I do that because I want her to know that I appreciate her love. Mm, how does God show us his love? Romans says that he commended his Lord love toward us in, while, in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, that's love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemy to God, we were in opposition to him. We were actually, we hated him when we were sinners. The scripture says in Romans that because the cardinal mind is enemy to God, for it is not subject to the laws of God, neither can it be. So while we were yet sinners and enemies of God, he saved us. He died for you and me. That's love. That's love. Notwithstanding all the things that we had against him. He still died for us. He died because my life matters to him. Your life matters to him. My life is of such a priority and of such importance to God, and he puts such value on me. He puts such a value on you that he chose to sacrifice his son for you. Wow. For you. He put such value on you that he chose to sacrifice his son for you. Your life is a priority to God. It's a priority to God. You know, but we'll say, but you know, I'm just one person in billions. Your life is still a priority. Then somebody said, well, you know, but I'm nobody special. It doesn't matter. Your life is yet a priority to God. But you say, but I'm not rich. I'm, I'm not famous. That doesn't matter. Your life, your life is a Priority to God. Yes, amen. See, that, that was this widow woman in the Bible. She didn't have anything. Matter of fact, uh, there was a devastating time in, 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 in the land in which she was living in. And things had got so bad that she thought that she was going to die. She didn't have anyone to turn to to ask for anything. She thought her life was meaningless. So she said, 
I got this last little bit of meal, and I'm going to address this meal, and me and my son are going to die because, you know what, our life is meaningless. It has no value. But God, but God, he sent the prophet Elijah to her, to her and her son. He told Elijah, go, I got this widow woman down there, and she's going to sustain you. And I find that interesting because she didn't have anything. But what she did have was a willing spirit. You know, if you got a willing spirit, you can get a lot of things from God. So Elijah went down to this widow woman, and of all the places God could have sent him, he sent him to this one seemingly unimportant, forgotten woman that she might live. Her life, no matter how seemingly unimportant, had a priority to God. Just like your life and my life. We might not think we have value, but we're important to God. She thought her life had no value, but it was a great value to God. And so is your life, and so is my life. Now, what I've what I come to understand is just like this woman. It doesn't matter how long we've been around or how long we've been saved or how long we've been walking with God that sooner or later some trial or tribulation is going to come into our life. And when that happens, the devil wants us to believe that God is not concerned. Hmm. He gets us and he asks us, does God really care? If God really cares, then why are you going through this? Isn't that how he approached the Lord, saying, if thou be the Son of God? He knew Jesus was the Son of God. He just likes to sow doubt. He knew Jesus was the Son of God, and he knew, and he knows God cares about you, but he just tries to sow doubt. Tries to sow doubt into your life, tries to sow doubt into my life, try to get us to disbelieve what God says about us. That's who he is. He wants us to believe that we're all alone in this. You know, sometimes I wonder how that happens. We know how good God is. But sometimes, somehow, some way, the devil get us to thinking that God has left us all alone. And we're all alone with our problems, and we're all alone with our troubles, and we're all alone, and there's nobody there to help. But I want you to know that we're not alone, that we are a priority to God. In the midst of all of our troubles, in the midst of everything that we go through, we're still on God's mind. And I want you to know that no matter what the devil tells you, we're never alone. We're never by ourselves. There's always somebody there that we can depend on. But the enemy wants us to believe that we're by ourselves and that no one cares. And when he tells us that, we know that God cares. Hmm. Sometimes he wants us to believe that we don't have any hope. 
And we also know that that's not so. The love of God is poured out on us. The love of God is poured out in our lives. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The love of God is poured out on us. Let me get to my point here. In the book of Romans it says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations work patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. God pours his love out on us in the midst of our troubles. But the enemy wants us to believe that our lives have no value. Hmm. But God wants you to know that you have enough value for him to save you. And if he values you enough to save you, he values you enough to preserve you. Amen. He values you enough to keep you in the midst of all your troubles. He values you enough to keep you when you think you're falling. He values you enough to keep you when you think all around you is crumbling. The scripture says, now unto him that is able to keep me from falling. He'll keep you from falling and he'll keep you from stumbling. He will keep you from falling in the trouble. He will keep you from falling out of his grace. He will keep you from falling into that trap of the enemy. He will keep you from falling into anything the devil sets up as a snare against you. He's able to keep you from falling. That's what the love of God is all about. In the midst of everything the enemy wants to do to us, the love of God is there to say no. These people, my people, are of such great value to me that I will keep them in the midst of their storms. Listen, we all know that God is a keeper. We all know that God is a preserver. But what we sometimes don't realize is that the only reason he does these things for us is because he loves us. That's the only reason he does. He doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't have to keep us. He keeps us because he loves us. He doesn't have to protect us. He protects us because he loves us. So my question is, we know that he keeps us. We know that he makes a way and provides for us. We know that he does all of this thing freely because he doesn't have to. We know that he does all of these things in spite of ourselves, in spite of our ugliness. In spite of our hard-heartedness, in spite of our disobedience, he does all of these things. He is demonstrating his love to us day by day by day by day. <coughs> He's saying, I love you. He's saying, I care about you. He's saying, I want the best for you. He's doing everything he can to make your life everything he desires for it to be. He's opening doors because he loves you. He's keeping back the hand of the enemy because he loves you. We can't begin to understand how much that is or what that kind of love is or what that kind of love means or how deep that kind of love goes. We can't begin to understand it. We can accept it and say thank you. 
but we can't begin to understand it. So then my question is, if you know, if you know, if you have no doubt that somebody loves you on that level, that somebody loves you that deeply, not because of what you can do, not because of what you have, just because they love you. How do you respond to that? How do you respond to that? Do you just look and say, well, yes, he loves me because I'm so great. No, you're not great. How do you respond to that? How do you respond to that love? What do you do to let him know that, yeah, God, I appreciate that. And I'm going to love you right back. How do you respond to that love? Scripture tells us that we should love the Lord thy God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And with all our strength, it says. Now, you know, one thing, I can't, I may not be able to love as deeply as God. But one thing I can do is I can love him more today than I did yesterday. I can love him more today than I did yesterday. Let me ask you something. Have you ever got up in the morning and said, God, what can I do to make you happy today? What can I do to bring a smile to your face today, God? Have you ever got up and, and, and asked the Lord that? And I want you to know that, yes, we can, we can make God happy. Y'all, they know God could be happy. We can make God happy. We see in the Bible that God gets delighted. Sounds like happy to me. We see in the Bible that God can be pleased. Sounds a lot like being happy to me. When I'm pleased, I'm happy. Right. You better delights me, I'm smiling. So we can make God happy. How do you respond to his love? Do you respond to his love by wanting to put him first? Hmm. When the last time you said, God, it's just going to be you and me today. What do you want to do? When the last time you took a drive and put the Lord in the driver's seat, said, Lord, take me where you want me to go today. I'm in the passenger side. I'm just along for the ride. When the last time you put God in charge? When was the last time you got in your prayer closet and you told the Lord, Lord, I'm not looking for anything today. I'm not asking for anything. I don't want anything. I'm not looking for anything. My problems don't even matter today. I'm just looking for you. What I need don't really matter right now. How I feel doesn't really matter right now. I'm just looking for more of you. I just want to get a little bit closer to you. I just want you to know that I'm trying to love you like you love me. I know that I'll never make it, but God, I want to give it a shot. How do you respond to God's love? How do you respond to that? If you had a friend that just loved you and loved you and loved you and loved you and you never responded to that, what would they do? I'm pretty sure after some time that they would just walk away and say, I'm wasting my time. But I'm going to move on to somebody that appreciates what I do for me. God's not going to turn his back on you. He's going to love you anyway. But 
We need to respond to that in some kind of way. It's only right to respond. It's only right to let them know that you appreciate. It's only right. Glory be to God. How do you respond to God's love? The scripture says if you draw nigh to me, he says I draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. You should respond by wanting a closer relationship with God. You should respond by wanting God to have a closer relationship with you. Mm. Because when we respond to, to God's love with a desire or more of God, something wonderful happens. Something wonderful happens. Sometimes, my friends, it's, it's just not enough to come to church. Scripture lets us know. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, you know, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. But then you know what it says? That that's your reasonable service. That's what you're expected to do. But I tell you what, when someone loves you, you go beyond their expectations. I try to surprise her every now and then. I want to go beyond what she thinks I'm going to do. Because I wanted to know, I appreciate you, sweetie. I love you as much as you love me. Do you love God as much as God loves you? Are you trying to love God as much as God loves you? See, because when you begin to do that and get that deep desire for God, then something wonderful begins to happen. Something marvelous began to happen because then you begin to find out that things aren't all about you. You begin to think about other folk more than you begin to think about yourself. You begin to pray for others more than you begin praying for yourself. When you get so much of God inside of you, that love has to roll over. And when it rolls over, something marvelous has to happen. When you have so much of God's love in you, it has to spill over on somebody else. Something marvelous has to happen. So how will you respond to God's love? Will you just sit around and be business as usual? Or will you look for God to lead and guide you into something a little deeper than where you've gone before. How will you respond to God's love? Will you tell somebody else about God? When you love somebody, when you love somebody, you're going to tell somebody about them. You're not going to keep them locked up and you're not going to keep them a secret. I was glad to bring this little woman home. Woo. I had to tell somebody. When you love God as much as he loves you, you're going to have to tell somebody. You're going to have to let somebody else know there's somebody out there that loves you. You're going to have to let somebody else know that there's somebody out there that cares about you. Somebody has not forgotten you. Somebody loves you. The devil wants us to believe that no one will listen to us. That's what he tells us. No one will listen to you. No one wants to hear what you have to say, but I want you to know this right now. That God is preparing somebody's heart right here, right now, to hear a word from you. 
They're out there. God says, I've loved you and I've protected you and I've given you everything you need. I'm preparing hearts to hear from you about me. I'm preparing hearts that you can tell about my love to them. The love I have for you, tell them about it. He says, I'm preparing hearts. They're out there. All you have to do is go and speak. That's what happens those days when you say, Lord, what do you want us to do today? And you take a walk with the Lord. And before you know it, there's somebody he's prepared for you. But how are you going to respond to God's love? Listen. God will send you to speak to one person out of your way. Like he sent the prophet, the prophet Philip, the deacon, to speak to one man. God will send you to speak a word to someone. And when God sends you to speak a word into someone's life, they hear it, they believe it, and they remember it. I'm going to tell you this one thing. And we're going to just about be done. When I was a young man, I used to go to church. I was a churchgoer. And I had some friends that weren't churchgoers. We were all in the same boat, but I went to church. But one Sunday, our pastor was preaching. And when he was done and in his dismissal, he looked at us and he said, when y'all go out of here today, y'all go tell all your sinner friends, I said, they need to be in church. I was a young guy. So I went over to my friend's house. We were Sunday. We were going to watch football. And then I walked in and they said, ah, what the pastor preach about today? I said, the pastor told me to tell all my sinner friends. They need to be in church. That was my brother-in-law. Thirty-seven years later, we were at his house for Christmas dinner, sitting around the table. And he told that story about how I came in and told him that my pastor said, all my sinner friends need to be in church. I had forgotten all about that. But it's something about when a word comes to the right person at the right time, it stays with them. All we have to do is what God says do. God loves you. We'll never comprehend how deeply but I wanted to try to make the point that it's more than we know. And because it's so much more than, it, than we realize, it deserves a greater response than we think it do. It deserves a greater response than has been given. It deserves a response worthy of the people of God. Someone here today may not know the Lord. If we could stand. We hope this message has been a blessing to you today. When you are in our area, please consider joining us in person off exit 98 at One Harvest Place across from Walmart in Dublin.